Hi everyone and welcome to our MOOC. Um, we're really excited to have a fantastic panel from Zone with us. Tonight's MOOC is Unlocking Potential Careers in Tech with Zone. And Zone works on hundreds of innovative projects with technology at their core, but working in the tech industry isn't all about coding. So the panel will sort of share their insights as well as what they do. So backstage you have me, Aileen. Um, I'm a Code for Girls brand ambassador. So if you have any questions about Code for Girls or any other upcoming classes and events, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll get back to you. Um, I currently work as a delivery manager in fintech. I used to study and work as a chemical engineer in the energy industry, but decided to do a bit of a pivot change. Um, and I did that through Code for Girls, so that's quite fun. Um, so yeah, tonight we have a great team from Zone, uh, whom I'll introduce very shortly, and we'll have Q&A at the end. So please feel free to put your questions in the comments and we can ask them to our panel. So tonight uh, we have Shabana, a senior UX designer. So I'm just adding them in. We have Turi, a senior content designer. We have Katie, a pe the people and talent officer. And we have Paul, a technology partner. Hi, guys. So good to have you. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. So just to let participants know that the YouTube video will be up for a week or two after the session today. So if you'd like to rewatch the content, you can do so by visiting the same YouTube link. So now I'm just going to hand over to Katie to kick us off um, and have a really great session. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Katie, as Eileen mentioned, and I'm the People Officer here at Zone. Um, so just to give you a bit of a background of what we do, um, Zone is a customer experience agency inside of Cognizant. So we generate value for businesses by creating transformative customer experiences. Um, and we're really proud of our partnership with CoFirst Girls. Um, so it's no secret that women are still hugely underrepresented in the tech industry which is why this MOOC is brought to you by our Women in Digital series of events. Um, this programme actively promotes roles in digital and technology um, to help drive awareness of careers for women in the sector um, and to truly help to diversify a male-dominated industry. Um, so today we're bringing you a panel of experts to share their experiences and advice working in the tech industry and here at Zone. Um, you might notice that we've got um, one short this evening, which is Jess, our fabulous lead UX designer, um, who's unfortunately sick today. So apologies if this calls a little bit shorter than expected with the, um, the three people on the panel. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, so Zone is an experience agency, but I understand that experience is, is quite a wide term. Um, so we do everything from tech to design to employee experience. Um, and to give you a good idea of this, the panel that we've got today, from a wide variety of these roles and, and we'll be talking to you about how they integrate within the business. Um, so to kick off, let's get to know our panel. So could you all start by introducing yourselves, telling us a bit about your role and what you do at Zone? Oh. There we go then. Shabana, did you wanna did you want to start? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so hi, hi to everyone watching. I'm, I'm Shabana. I, I'm an experience designer at Zone. And uh, so my role is, is broadly looking at the sort of experiences, end-to-end -end experiences across our sort of digital products and services for our clients and customers. But also within that, I might be looking at user interface work, I partake in user research, and sometimes a little bit of strategy work. So it's quite a varied part of what I do. And um, I can't remember, Katie, what was your last question? Was it about how we got into our roles? It was. Um, yeah, I mean, we can, we can get to that as well. It'd be good to hear about how you, you did get into your role as well. And like, if it was always where you planned to kind of get into when you were looking. Oh, forgive me. I feel like I'm jumping ahead, but I'll, I'll just jump in then. So I studied graphic design at university. I, I always knew that I wanted a very creative career. And from a very young age, I was really passionate and really driven about trying to get towards something that looks like a creative discipline um, in design. And at that time, you know, there were not really some degrees within experience design, but I feel quite fortunate that within my within my studies, it was all about focused about how can you tell stories and narratives? How can you communicate some sort of end need back to people, human beings? So I thought that was a quite a good in, kind of entry into the industry. And um, 
yeah, I started um, the, there's no shortcut. I started the long way. So after graduation, went straight into doing internships. I did as many internships as possible and learned lots from people and had access to different types of projects and opportunities. And those really sort of helped me get into my sort of first entry job, which was for a pharma company. So I was a web designer, which is quite different. It wasn't my dream job per se, but it was definitely, um, definitely good. It helped me learn about other people, other adults at work, you know, how, how people work in teams and projects and um, just start off my career that way. Great. Um, how about yourself, Tori? Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm a senior content designer at Zone, I'm currently working on a government project, which is very service oriented, but have done pretty much everything from marketing on the way all the way through to web working on webs and web and applications um pretty much everywhere you need a word that's kind of what i've done um and just to sort of how i got here i'll try to keep it short because it was a long and winding path i actually started um, in graphic design uh, right out of, right out of secondary school and shifted into a university uh program in history which seems about as unrelated to, uh, to tech as you can get, but it turned out to be a really great way to get into tech writing because it's a very similar sort of approach to taking strange things and making them consumable by people. And pretty much have just tripped and fallen into a variety of jobs ever since then, all related to writing and content broadly and just kept saying yes to things. A few years ago, I got a certification in UX design, which sort of prepared me to get into the content design, which is now really coming up as an actual career path, largely driven by government things, but mostly people are realizing that communication and content is what gets people into a site and, in, and into an experience and keeps them there. So it's becoming really, really important. And yeah, that's where I, that's how I got here. Paul? Yeah, so I'm Paul on the technology partner design, sort of think of that as head of engineering as well. Uh, there's two sides to my role. So um, internally facing, I head of the engineering community and look after the careers of uh, the engineers in that community. It's made up of anything you need to make a product basically. So that could be um, cloud infrastructure, DevOps, backend engineers with Java, .NET, uh, Node, or front engineers and um, React and QA as well, QE as we call them sometimes. Um, externally facing, I work with clients, so um, I help them with their sort of overarching technology direction and strategy, and then I um, actually bring new clients into Zone and set them up. Uh, I also have accountability across all the engagements in Zone for technology output. I've got a very good team of directors who work uh, on each engagement, facilitating the teams, making sure we deliver on time and helping clients with their onward work. Um, and then there's some accounts where I get pulled into a little bit more um, but because we don't have directors on, I get really busy. Um, but you could probably think as part of that, I cover quite a few things from sort of quality of output, hiring, bringing more people into the zone, looking after people's careers. So that's probably what I do in a nutshell. Um, my background, it was a practitioner. So I was a .NET developer for about 15 years and then moved up through architecture, uh, moved into director role and now this role. Uh, I came through the classic path. So the classic sort of uh, higher education route, you could call it. So I did, a, did an A-level in computer science and did a degree in computer science. And then um, I got my first job at a web development agency uh, who were very kind, who took me on um, with, had a year of industry experience. Uh, but they took me on with not much more than that and then um, helped me grow, which was, uh, I've always been very, very, very pleased and very thankful for that. Um, to where I get to where I am today, I don't think I had a grand plan. So I was thinking about this the other day, and I, some people had like, a, I want to be this, um, and they can have it from an early age. My sister is actually a doctor, and she had the vision that she wanted to be a surgeon from an early age, and she sort of planned everything behind that. Um, I wasn't necessarily one of those people. I think there's two different paths you can take. I was more the exploratory path, you could say. So I tried things and then experimented and decided what I liked and what I didn't like. So I know I liked tech, so I got into that. 
Um, when you're new, you try all different sorts of technology, front end, back end, databases, infrastructure, and then you sort of settle on what you like. And then we're like back end work is all the logic. So I'm sort of going to that. And then at some stage in my career, I'll go into details, I did a bit of project management, so I didn't like that too much. Did a bit of IT support, wasn't too keen on that, and then sort of moved my way around. Uh, and wrote programs for quite a long time, web-based ones, and uh, wanted to get more into the sort of upfront stuff, the designing and the, and the strategy direction of the technology. So then I started to think, right, I want to move into architecture and, and, and uh, direction from there. Great. So would you would you recommend people to kind of do a similar thing, as in try different parts, mm. see what they like before deciding yeah. on a role? I think I think I don't think either way is right. I think whatever works for you. So don't be stressed if you don't have a big vision. I I know people, <laughs> if I was honest, maybe I don't exactly know like what I want to do next, um, what the big big idea is, but I think that's fine. And everyone does different things. So if you don't have that big vision, then um, try different stuff and see everything as a learning opportunity. So sometimes it can be quite easy to try something new. Like when I tried that project management stuff for a bit, it wasn't 100% my choice, but I did it, did it, went into it, and um, afterwards sort of reflected on all the stuff I'd learned. So I learned things about very moving, like moving a business between offices, networking, um, how to manage other people's workloads, tasks, plan something out. And you can sort of take those positive experiences and then feed them into your future ambitions and play them into um, interviews you go into as well. So. I would say don't worry about it if you're starting out. Just just if you've got a plan, that's brilliant. If you don't have a plan, just try things and, and, and go with what you like. Great. And so if we were to give people a bit more of an idea of what it's like to actually work in an agency, who are the types of people that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, does it tend to change? Like how does that work for each of your roles? To so say like Turi, how does that work yeah, on it your side? It depends on the project largely. Um, typically, I'm, I will work with a, a UI UX designer, always have a dev on hand. There's like a, a fully integrated team will have the design side and then the, the build side. And so we have to work really closely together. So I'm constantly interacting with developers to, to help them understand what our goals are and how, help them sort of build the thing that we've designed. I'm working with designers to make sure that the content that I'm creating or that I'm helping create fits visually, fits you know technically within the, the scope of what we're trying to achieve. Um, work with clients a lot. There's a lot of relationship building that needs to happen both internally and externally to make sure that things go smoothly and that everyone is heading in the same direction. And the, the number of these in, the, the number of these people that you work with depends on the size of the project obviously but it's it's pretty pretty similar across the board that it, it tends to be a spectrum of people i'm not like stuffed in a corner only talking to other content folks it's a it's a steady state of interacting with lots of interesting smart people yeah i'd like to agree with that terry i think um because we basically help clients build build products you need a diverse um, set of people to build a product from various different backgrounds and uh, skills, like Terry was saying, from content, from engineering, or from data, or from delivery, or from UX. You need a balance of each role to actually create the product. And I'd say that's what I quite like about working in agencies. Uh, you get to meet different people from different backgrounds, and you get to um, learn a lot as well. So if you think you work in that cross-functional team, and maybe you can pick up some stuff on UX or you can understand a bit more about data. It's, um, it's quite a interesting and uh, varied environment. Yeah, you learn a lot working with, with other disciplines that doesn't necessarily change how you work in your day to day, but it gives you a lot of insight in how they work in their day to day. And that makes getting things done easier because you can figure out how to how to communicate with them, how to you know, speak their language to to get to get things done. Yeah. I would add to that to sorry, Paul, go for it. No, no, you go. I would just add to that, you know, to the point of speaking someone else's language is uh, sometimes you might find that within a, a a team or a squad that you're the only person of that skill set. Um, skill set. 
So you might be the only writer or the only designer, and that's cool, that's okay, but that's also a challenge that you might have to sort of educate your wider team about, well, what is design and why does research matter? And why do we want to, for example, validate or prove that an idea or a feature in a product is good and that it works? So you might find that you're wearing different hats, but it, I, honestly, it's great for growth and stretch. It's great to kind of push you out of your comfort space. So um, team, team varies, like Terry said. Yeah, definitely. And I think you can learn a lot from other disciplines. I, I find that anyway. I, um, I, when I was at Zone a little while ago, when I was in my previous role as a director, um, I partnered with a experienced director who I learned a lot from. Uh, a guy called Vitama, and it's, I found that I could take a lot of the practices and approaches that the experience team were, were following and bring it into the technology mindset. So you um, you sort of you can learn new things and then adapt how you've been used to doing things to be better based on what you're learning from different different people and different backgrounds. Great. So if you can tell yourself anything on the first day of your job at the beginning of your careers what would you tell yourself shabana do you want to go yeah i've actually got two things if i may so one is whatever the thing is that got you there so hopefully it's bags of curiosity always keep that never lose it doesn't matter where you're traveling and what that landscape is keep stay with the curiosity and the other thing, uh, if I could travel back in time, I would definitely tell myself, which I learned much later on, is one of my favorite, most loved fashion designers, uh, Diane von Furstenberg. So she talks about how the most important relationship you have in life is with yourself. And to further that, she, she said something around every person or every woman's first best friend should be herself. So that kind of energy and that kind of love that you would have for like a best friend and how well you want them to do in their journey or their career, champion that for yourself. So put yourself in, in your best shoes and um, just, yeah, go for gold. Like cheer yourself on first, is what I'd say. I love that. <laughs> I only know this now, later, like much later on. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late, you're fine. This is it. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I chip in. I think I, I just want to think about this a bit before actually. I think I've probably come, I have three, four things, I think, but that sounds like a lot. Um, maybe I didn't know much when I started, and <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff to tell myself now. Um, I would probably say don't be afraid to ask questions, and um, definitely in the tech industry, like, it's so vast and so varied, it, you can't know everything, so it's always good to ask. And when you're starting out, people are expecting you to ask questions. They don't expect you to work a lot yourself. And it might be a little bit odd if you didn't ask questions, actually. So definitely always feel like you can do that. Um, one of the things I think I would like to tell myself is to get involved in company initiatives more. Um, and uh, I think people are a lot better at these days. Sort of just throw yourself into the company culture. Uh, it's a good way to get noticed. And the more people who know you're there, um, you know, it's a good way to progress in your career if people know you're there and you get seen. Um, so in my, a bit of advice my dad gave me as well actually is about uh, speaking up and it sort of relates to that thing about don't be afraid to ask a question. Uh, he said to me, I think this was probably as I was entering my first job, he said um, in a meeting, just try and say something. Uh, whether it's like it can be a question or it can be just sort of reinforcing someone else's point that you just thought was good or it could be commenting on someone else's point but if you get used to raising your opinion in question in a meeting uh you'll you'll be able to do it more and more and you won't have like the nervousness about it and then another it's another way for people to notice you as well so if you're in certain meetings and you're raising points or just saying oh that was that was interesting i liked how you discussed that thing um, it gets you in people's eyes and it's always good to help your career progress if you get noticed. And the last one would be uh, to remember that um, not everyone knows everything and I think that applies maybe, I can be told otherwise, but maybe to engineering more than anything because it changes every couple of months. Um, so uh, the most experienced technologist might not know something you know because 
you read up about the latest thing we're to know about it maybe you've been reading up about ai and they haven't got into that yet or blockchain or or just something about react because react's particularly specialized and someone else might not know that piece of react um so yeah don't, don't be afraid to raise raise opinions and give your thought but then be open to feedback and be noticed know that you don't know everything i think as i progressed through my career i gradually learned all the stuff i didn't know um after thinking i knew a lot i'd probably say things have a funny way of working out for the best even if in the moment it feels like an absolute catastrophe like i've been fired from jobs two or three times now and in the moment it's terrifying and awful but every single time it has set me up for something so much better that i that i couldn't have planned on my own so it's sort of taken the fear out of out of things like that and and made me able to look at it um, as an opportunity so there's that and then the other is just say yes say yes to stuff somebody offers you an interesting project that you don't know how to do say yes and then figure it out somebody offers you an opportunity to go to a conference or take a class or something that just seems completely unrelated to what you're doing say yes because you never know when that random bit of education or experience is going to come back in a way that is way useful that you just never could have planned for so it's probably that and then you know be nice to people because it's easy to do yeah which is really important and i guess listening to this it all kind of links back to we have like quite a strong mentor network at zone um so like shabana do you want to talk about that a little bit as well Yes, so Zone is actually the first place I've ever been that offers mentoring, which is fabulous. Um, so we've got some really passionate people at Zone that are really sort of, they recognize the importance of mentoring. And, um, you know, various people uh, in service design and delivery management roles have really sort of shaped how, what it is to be a mentor at Zone and, and how it can be accessible to everyone that works here and works with us. And, I, you know, it just in a setup, it's uh, we've got, Anyone could be a mentor or a coach, or you could be somebody who you've got some capacity to give back to someone else in their journey about growth or some sort of stretch or um, sort of advice and progression. And you can find people on, you know, we've got Notion, we use that as a database. You can find people and see if they sort of match what you're looking for, what you want to do. Simply drop them a Slack and agree between you sort of times in a format that might work. But um, but in, in a nutshell, it's uh, we're a big place and but it doesn't feel like that because everyone's accessible and there's so, there are so many people that do want to give back or can just spare 20 minutes and have a chat with you and give you feedback about your work or it could be anything. Um, one of the great things I heard was somebody in a more sort of engineering facing role wants to move to a more client facing role. So perhaps there are other types of human skills that they just want to get practice with or get good feedback on and that's something you can do at Zone. So. It's, it's a good model that we've got. Yeah. And if we have people that are, say, like new in their career and are looking for a mentor, what would you recommend they look for? I would pass, yeah, I'd personally say do some homework. So identify within yourself what, what is it that you want to develop in further? How do you want to stretch? What is it that you want to be better at? And go and identify a person who is doing those things or you associate that with them have a chat because it needs to work for the both of you. Have a chat with them and find out, is that something that vice versa makes sense in this relationship? Do this with as many people as you want to and, and sort of find that balance. But when I do this personally, and I've done this a few times at Zone, I'll find someone that I look up to and it will be for a specific reason. Once I've identified that and I think, I want to learn this and I want to be better, I've just gone and had conversations. So that I think that's the best way to start. How about yeah. you, Terry, Paul? I should you just go on the right, but Terry, do you want to go? No, go on. Uh, I was just going to add to what Shabana was saying then about um, uh, having, like, going for those people that you think you can learn from. I was going to say it doesn't have to be in your craft area. What I mean by craft area is like, well, would be engineering. Uh, you can look for people outside. So I've asked, I've got, I've had mentors from other areas, like in client relationships, skills, project management skills, because it helps you sort of create your rounded self. You don't necessarily just have to stick to your lane. Um, 
and especially if you have you've identified certain weaknesses in yourself that you want to get better at um it's a good way of doing that learning from people are very good very Tori. i was just going to say um it does you can you can find mentors in anything like it doesn't even have to be career related like if it's anytime you expand your understanding of something that interests you that's going to build your personal portfolio if you will and like no education is wasted take a class in basket weaving you know find somebody who can help you get better at public speaking you take a, you know learn a language any of these things you can do through a mentoring through a mentoring scenario but just you know classes in general or just you know self education it's always going to add more color to your rainbow if you will and that always looks good and it's, it makes life more fun. Like if you're focused only on business related things or career related things, life gets pretty dull. Okay. So if we come back to bias, specifically like in the technology industry, and um, have you experienced any bias during your career? And how have you overcome it if you have? Paul, I guess. Uh, no, no, um, not as much. Um, obviously, I'm a white male, so I'm in the majority. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've seen, I haven't think about this before, I don't think I have seen it, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, and I know that obviously it does happen. Um, so from my side, it's about, and we'll go into this in a bit later, I think, it's about um, listening and researching and understanding other people's experiences and trying to empathise with them, and then um, and take it from there to try and help from, I guess, my side of the privileged position. And I guess as females, Cherry, Shabana, have you experienced anything similar to that? Yeah, I mean, I think almost every woman has experienced something. Um, unfortunately, throughout your sort of time and career, when I think back to in my 20s, now when I think about things, I, you know, I can recognise lots of moments of, forms of bias that's probably unacceptable today no doubt but um, I mean just small things like I've always worked at the beginning of my career in very sort of male dominated teams and um, they've been okay they've been good roles and good opportunities but it's things like language language that might have come through that you know I'd be uncomfortable with or I think oh I don't think you can address people like that and so on and so forth um, what I know sort of now when I think what my bias is is talk about things you know everyone has a voice and everyone should feel respected and welcome and you should feel good at work you're all there for a common goal so if there's something that doesn't feel right and if it's not about it might not be yourself it might be it might be something you've observed or it could be indeed you've experienced it every workplace every organization has a massive interest in saying we are very humanity driven and we are a good place to be and we want people to be happy. So talk about it, talk about it to your manager or talk about it to somebody that you can escalate this to. But just be open, have good conversations around it. And, you know, at, hopefully, at, you know, at some point we can say these things are quite, quite rare or these things will disappear all the way altogether. But it will start with good conversations. Pretty much what Shabana said, I think in retrospect, um, I, like I can't call out specific incidences, but in retrospect, I look back at just sort of general interactions over time and can definitely recognize the shift from when I was young, very young and just getting started to how just interacting with with everyone, adults broadly at that point and how that how there's been such a shift to now where we, we can have these conversations where it's okay to stand up for yourself, where it's okay to stand up for other people and the repercussions are much better for everybody in the end. But um, I, I'm i pretty oblivious to a lot. And so I suspect that there was a lot of a lot of bias thrown my way that I just didn't pick up on, which is actually kind of fine because I just meant that I charged ahead and did my own thing anyway. And that seemed to work out okay. So if you're oblivious, carry on friends. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like to promote women in digital and the technology industry, we need to give women a voice and it's kind of got to come from the top. So men and all genders have to play their part too. Um, and this is where allies kind of come, allies, sorry, are so important and they, they come in to play. So I guess, have you got any tips on how to be an ally, specifically Paul? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think probably everyone does it differently. For me, I guess it's about recognizing that you're in a certain position of privilege, is where I put in it, um, and that potentially you got into that position. Um, well, recognizing that you're in the position of privilege could mean that you got there not just on your own merit, uh, maybe because you're in the majority group. Um, that could be a little bit uncomfortable to think about, but I think you need to to sort of recognize it and then, and then move on. Um, and just because you haven't seen um, prejudice necessary in the workspace doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Maybe you haven't noticed, maybe because, because I've worked in in a problem itself, <laughs> lots of male teams, right? So that's the problem in its own right. Um, maybe that's that's the reason. Uh, I think once you understand those things occur and, and make sure you accept it and are open to everything, uh, you've got to educate yourself uh, on what is actually happening, uh, whether that's doing research yourself um, and watching videos and podcasts from people in the industry or whether it's actually speaking to people uh, directly. If there's people that you can speak to, it can be, yeah, I think you have to have a decent relationship with that person to be able to have discussions like this. But if you do, I think that's brilliant. Um, and once you're listening to people to actually empathize with it, so um, really listen, don't just sort of take it on board and go, oh yeah, okay, actually, actually understand what's happening. Um, and then you probably need to understand that you'll never really know what it feels like. So if you haven't been in that position, it's hard to know what it feels like to ever be in it. Uh, and you just accept that and and do your best to support. So I think I've been quite fortunate to work with some really brilliant people. Um, there was, there's a lot of engineers in the community who you know, they, they raise questions, they challenge status quo, and I've had some really good discussions with them. I went through a, a initiative a little while back where I spent um, an hour or so with a lot of people from the community, lots of meetings, um, and just basically had some listening sessions. So I just sat down and listened to what people had to say. And I sort of set it up as I wasn't really going to explain or try and talk about anything. I just wanted to listen and ask questions. And I learned a lot from that. It's quite sort of liberating just saying, like, you talk and, and I'll listen to what you have to say. And see where people go. And I, I definitely learned a lot from that. And I've always been very grateful for those people for, for having the courage to say those things. So um, like it's not always comfortable to talk about these sort of issues in, in, in the wider industry to, um, to people, but I think especially um, people in certain positions. So I think I've always been, always will be grateful for them on that. And then I guess little things you can do, small things. Um, uh, I heard recently a while back, a little while back, um, of a female colleague in a meeting who was being uh, talked over a little bit by one of uh, male colleagues and wasn't given the chance to speak. And one of our other male colleagues sort of actually stepped in and said, um, can you stop talking over her? Because I really want to hear her opinion. I think you know, we'll benefit from it. And helping out by stepping in and, and saying that I heard was actually um, very welcomed. So uh, we've got a bit of a culture to try and pull stuff out if we see it happening in meetings. And I think that's good. I don't think that happens very much in time at all. But then, uh, then in terms of hiring as well. So uh, what we can do uh, and actively do do is try and uh, source a pool of diverse candidates when we try and bring people into our community. Uh, to create more balance and then uh, we make sure that we have uh, women as part of all the stages and the stages in the interview process to make sure there's a balanced view and it's not just uh, one-sided so we so we uh, increase the chance of, of more diverse people coming into the community and we actively seek out um, women as well uh, to come into engineering we've been um, looking out for senior leads as well which had some um, really good highs recently which i'm very happy about uh and then we also have apprenticeship schemes as well which i know we're going to a little bit later but trying to build up the grassroots as well and then outside of that i guess once people are into companies is actually taking interest in careers and actively trying to um you know, sponsor people and bring them 
คุณลุงช่วยพี่นะครับพี่ลุงช่วยด้วยครับใส่ไลท์ลิงก์เองในสิ่งนี้และดังนั้นที่คุณกำลังพูดถึงเมื่อกี้ How would someone look for the right job, um, and how is someone to know what the right job for them is? So I know you mentioned trying different areas is a good way, but would you recommend anything else, Shabana? Yeah, I think you kind of spot on there, Katie. Like try different things. So there's no such thing as a perfect job, but there is such thing as believing in a particular service or having an affinity with some kind of product. Um, in those areas, like especially across our disciplines of design and writing, and technology and product, it really matters that you care about this thing that you're working on with a team. So that that's a great first start. If you if you have that kind of um, like that sort of wish, like I want to be, I want to build good things with them. I want to be part of that team. I'd say just go for it. You know that should be a good first start to get stuck in. And it's really okay to do a series of jobs that maybe are not your favorite things in the world. Because you're going to grow, you're going to learn, and it's grow up in a role as well. I certainly did that from when I started out after my uh, from my degree onwards. And um, the more you sort of gather experience, the more then you've got that gravitas, and you can start saying that is going to be a good fit for me, and I think I'm going to be wonderful in that company. And you can just basically go for it. Trust your gut when you're interviewing. It's as much you interviewing the company as the company interviewing you. And if you get any weird vibes, don't do it. Also, you know what Shabana mentioned. You know it's okay to take a job that meets an immediate need while you look for a better one or the right one or something more in line with what's important to you. Like it's okay to need to make money, just to you know pay rent. But yeah, it's um, interviewing is a two way street. And you learn what what's important to you through that process. So just yeah, follow your instincts, trust your gut. You'll find you'll find your people. Yeah, I totally agree with those. Um, I would add practice. So interviewing is a bit of a skill in its own right. Uh, and just try out. Just go to interviews. Um, obviously, you need a bit of interest in the role, uh, but definitely um, don't don't just wait for. Like the best role to come along that you really want, um, go to all sorts of different interviews. And when I started interviewing, I think for my second role, uh, I went to quite a few different ones, and I kept notes after each interview, and sort of noted down the things that I did wrong, or noted down technical questions that they asked, and then I'd go away and work on it. Different, you know, find a better way to introduce myself at the start, or. Understand how to do that thing in JavaScript and research. And as I went through the interview process for the last one, I'd covered almost almost all the questions that I could get. So I was a lot more practiced. And those are sort of the that was the role I actually wanted. So by the time you get to the one you want, you're you're uh, you're more relaxed in it, and you can be a lot more natural. Okay. And so, what extras? Can you know? I put on a CV. Or what experience can I get to make me stand out if I was looking to get into this industry? Do side projects that interest you. Like I, um, when I was interviewing for Zone, actually, I, um, I would do. I designed concert posters for vocal groups in the city where I lived at the time, and. I liked them. I thought I did some interesting, fun work, and so I actually included that as part of my portfolio, not as the main point, but just like, by the way, I also do this other thing. And it actually came up in interviews two or three times that I had this little section, and they thought that that added just sort of interest and complexity to me as a potential employee because I wasn't just a one-trick pony. I didn't only just do words. I also did these other things, and so. Things that sort of show broader interest, um, that show exploration and curiosity. I know Shabana brought that up early on. Just anything that sort of shows that you're complex as a person is going to help. I think sort of paint a fuller picture of who you are for the people that you're talking with. Yeah, I would add on top of that um, about sort of showing all sides of you um, in terms of your your personality as well. So I think people are keen to put on CVs. Academia and accomplishments and awards. It can be very hard if you're starting out in your journey or you're early on. So take take the opportunity, like take advantage of talking about other things that you're involved in. Very much as Tiria has spoken to, um, 
years ago I had I went to an interview and before I attended I was emailed and I was asked to bring my light side and my dark side and I just thought this this is what, what does this mean but it was their way of saying um we want to also see the other side of Shabana we know that you're a designer but what else are you about CV is a good space for that you know hackathons passion projects um do you have a book, book club or do you know do you go cycling or running with a group are you doing any kind of voluntary work are you a massive Eurovision fan? Whatever it is, like that's your other side of yourself, and um, don't be don't be afraid to be creative. It will help you stand out. Definitely, yeah, that's really important. Go, uh, just picking up on something Terry said as well about projects. I think that's really relevant for tech people. So, um, like when we interview more senior engineers, you generally talk a lot about experience. But obviously, if you're coming into the industry, you won't have that much experience. So. To give people something to talk about, it's good, like Terry said, to have those um, personal projects. And it could be setting up like a website, it could be fiddling with anything, you know, testing, you could be setting up a little server. Uh, it gives you time to talk about and it shows that you're curious and you can try lots of different things. So, the main things, I guess, for coming into the technology space is to show that you're sort of interested in learning and you're excited by it. And um, you're always curious because it's going to keep changing. Everyone to start. Um, and we've had we've had a few questions come in, which I think are kind of related to this as well. But so, as an agency, like, what are the main qualities that we're looking for in a candidate when we're interviewing? Um, and it looks like we've got a few people that are changing sectors, um, or you know, wanting to know if there's some like kind of transferable skills when doing this. So, what would you? What would you recommend, Paul? Yeah, um, I was just saw that pop up. Uh, um, so I was thinking back to previously in my career, I worked with someone I forgot his name who um, he didn't actually work in programming, but then he stepped sideways into it. Um, and I think uh, what's the Project management, right? So in project management, there's a lot of decent transferable skills in there. So managing your workload, um, communication. So something we look for in agencies is the ability to, to communicate. <laughs> Trump stuff, double over my word. Ability to communicate with other people and uh, to build relationships. So it sounds like if you work in that space, you probably have some really good transferable behavioral skills. And then um, it's all about just showing that you're enthusiastic about the, the tech side. So if you, um, I think, this chap that I worked with a while ago, he had a side project. He built some things, he built a website, he was learning about unit testing and things like that. And um, he came in and, and just chatted through those those things and we talked to him about um, like hypotheticals, what would you do in this situation? And you don't need to have experience in it, you just sort of talk through your thoughts and be yourself and I think you can, can transfer over. Hopefully that helps. And then how about you, Tori? You know, if we're interviewing candidates, what are the kind of qualities you think we would look for, even coming from, say, like Zone? I, well, I, I know that somebody um, posted a question about shifting from pharmacy into tech. And I want to say that you are probably one of the only people on earth who can legitimately say you have a keen attention to detail, which moving into programming is going to stand <laughs> you in very good stead. Beyond that, I when I'm interviewing people, I look for some of the, I hate to say it, but the soft skills, like, are they open to learning? Are they willing to, you know, how, how do they collaborate with people? Are they interested in collaborating with people? Um, are they open to new experience? Are they curious? So, uh, I mean, that's from a, from a content perspective, obviously I look to see what they're, you know, can they write, can they organize information? You know, what, what is their practical experience, but largely, um, a culture fit is a better place to start than a technical skill. And so I, that's sort of where I come from. It's like, is this somebody that I could work with? Is this somebody who I could have a heated discussion about a topic with that wouldn't end up in a huge argument and one of us getting fired? Like, can we, can we interact with each other in a variety of emotional states and have our professional relationship continue well? Um, are they... Do they, you know, can we bounce ideas off each other? Can we, you know, like it's just, it, it tends to be much more personal stuff because you can teach somebody the skill, 
but you can't necessarily teach somebody how to interact and communicate in a community well. And so it's it's an important thing to think about when you're interviewing you know, can you, fit, does, does that community sound like a place you want to be? And it's an important thing when we are interviewing is, will this person come into our community and, and do well there? Will they thrive? Yeah, and I think it also comes down to, you know, look into the company that you're applying for, do some research, find out about it before you go into interview. So you have that background to know what you're talking about as well for the fit. Um, and we've got one more question, actually, an interesting one. Um, so Maha, I think, asks, what is the work-life balance within your tech roles? How do you make sure that you don't let the work consume you and your rest days? So I get we can kind of relate that to tech and design. Paul, what would you say? Uh, it's, yeah, it's a good question. Um, it, I guess, it's a tricky one to answer. I'd say... It helps what the company's like. Um, so at Zone, we we uh, we want people to have a life outside work. Um, so we do try and manage projects so they don't uh, stretch into people's personal lives, and we have flexible working as well, so that people can deal with other things in their life outside work. Um, I personally struggle with it. Uh, work life balance. I always have. That's probably something I need to work on. Um, I've got I've one of those minds who doesn't like leaving a problem. Uh, but I think having outside interests, having things that you have to go to, uh, definitely helps pull you away from work. Um, and people will always respect if you've got other things to do. Uh, so for example, um, before the pandemic, I was going to dance classes every Friday, so I knew half six. On a Friday, I was out the door. Uh, yeah, um, and that sort of released all the thoughts from my mind because I was too busy concentrating on how to dance. <laughs> I'm not a natural dancer uh, compared to other things. Um, so, yeah, I think you find someone that respects your work life balance and um, try and protect it yourself, whether that's through like promising yourself you're going to shut the computer at a certain time. Um, or whether it's finding hobbies or or just reading a scripture or something. <clears throat> How about you, Shabana, from a design perspective? Yeah, I think um, it's a really relevant question for Maha. I think part of, Paul, what you said is, is super important is you need to set your own boundaries. So it's okay to close your MacBook at 5.30, it's okay to have a lunch and actually have a lunch for, I mean, I say this, my lunch is typically 30 minutes, but if you've got an hour for lunch, why not spend the other 20 or 30 and go for a walk? Um, so boundaries and, and your own rules are so important because once you create those, other people will respect that and recognize that around you. And with regards to the rest days, uh, you know, you, you can answer this yourself, Maha, so the, the, the secret's already there. Your rest day is yours. Don't think about work. It's your day. Go and do anything you want. Take, take that time off to switch off and reset yourself uh, and do all those things. So when it comes to Monday morning, when you wake up, you do feel good. And when you're in your meeting, if it kicks off at nine o'clock, actually you're ready. So those things really matter. Uh, and I think also, you know, what's really interesting is that from a design perspective, whenever I speak to designers, and this is so true, design doesn't end. It's not a nine till five without being too dramatic. It's basically your whole life. So uh, I create extra rules around myself if I can feel that I'm doing other things that slip into quite a conscious state of mind where I'm trying to do something as a designer. So then purposely I will go and go on my bike or I'll just watch a series, something on Netflix, which is so different from my own life because it means I can escape. But, uh, but then the joke's on you because, you know, design is not a nine to five, folks. It's your whole life. But if you love it, then you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I think that's all for the questions as well. So thank you everyone for listening tonight. And you know, we'll pass back to Aileen and the Code First Girls team. So that's everything. Thanks very much, guys. Um, lots of really good questions from 
all of the audience as well as you guys just sort of sharing your insights and you know what you think is really important I have a final question for all of you actually um and the question is like what's the one thing that you want the audience to take away from tonight so cheery i'm gonna pick you as the first person to go and then we'll go around you the world is your oyster, honestly. Like you're here at Code First for Girls to learn a skill and that's just gonna be a springboard for other things. So, you know, take this education and then turn it into whatever you want it to be. The path isn't made for you, you get to make it yourself. Very good answer. Shivana, do you wanna go? I would say, so there are no limits create all the things that you want in your own life, but be thirsty and be hungry. Go and find good resources, meet with the people, come to more events like this. Um, there's so much education online and on social media. So uh, just be present and take advantage of those things. Okay, and Paul? Um, I would say uh, explore and don't be afraid to make a mistake. And that relates to um, technology itself. So the way you can learn is by experimenting and see what works and what doesn't, especially in personal projects, but it also relates to careers. So um, maybe it's not the perfect role, you're not sure, maybe you should go with it. Like um, Terry was saying, you know, it gets you into a position, gets you work experience, and there's always positive you can take from it. And if you decide when you're in there it's not right, you can always um, get, get, what it, get from it what you can and then make a plan to move on and then adjust and you've got that experience, you've got that extra knowledge to know what you're looking for in the future. So um, explore and learn from that. All right, thank you. And Katie, what about you? Uh, I would say, you know, be passionate, be keen and don't be scared to, to make a change or find something else that interests you. Like I never thought that I could even get into tech when I was younger, it wasn't an option. So. I love that it's out there now. So don't be afraid to, to make that change and go for it. And also, if you are interested in working in tech and maybe working at Zone, keep an eye out in the next year or so when we're running the apprenticeship scheme again, like there are gonna be options out there for you to get involved. Um, so hopefully you take away some of this advice um, and get in touch. Great, thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you, panel, for your time this evening. I think the audience really appreciated it and enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, thanks so much again and have a really good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.